Don't do this to me. Oh, you scared. I sky. Do that. I almost cried. I almost just cried. Whole screen went gray. Okay. We're, are we finally good? Am I finally? Am I finally good? Oh my god. It's like a miracle. You hear me? Why do you hear me? Let's not do that. Like, still? Like, I heard you say we're fine. Okay. Why? Is it, is it Rachel? Why are you here? It's picking up me and not. Why is it? Okay, I'll look around. I, I it is now picking up me instead of the microphone. Okay, I'll, I'll find you. Yes, like it's yes, picking up me you. through the computer. And I don't. Well, you have to go into your settings, your audio settings. Click on that. Why is Click on the codec. It's still me, though. Right? It's still me, or no? Come on now, I'm speaking right now. I think it is. I don't. All I had to do is click that. That's the codec. Yeah, that make that uh, because that's if that's the if that's the. But it's still picking up through the computer. Is that your input or output? That's output and no, input. Sure. That should be input. No. Uh, she went to check. You want input into the computer, so that's fine. Yeah. Output, uh, you don't want that. What you we... want internal speakers, I guess. It's, but it's, I don't know, why is it still picking me up? Why is it on me? I don't know what you got going on over there, but hmm? I said I don't know what you got going on over there. I yeah, the, you should have the codec for the for the input. Yeah, I do. So you, you should be fine. It's still picking you up. Yeah, it's still picking me up. Right? Yeah, it's I don't. I don't know what to do. Uh, The, the built-in mic is picking me up. Yeah, isn't that, that's what a built-in mic does. It goes into the computer. This is also picking me up. The USB is also picking me up. Everything is picking me up. None of these are picking up the microphones. They're just picking me up. I think. Let's see. Is this... This is not picking me up. <laughs> what in the... Don't go green. When you go green, you make me sad. Okay. Is this... This is not... No. I'm... Literally, all of them are picking me up. 
Why? Why? Okay. Hello. Hello, hello. Don't. I don't want that. Hello, hello, hello. Um, in the Prime Minister's foreign policy team um, and then came here to cover US politics about two months ago. Uh, no, I started um, just after the referendum. So. Um, history in French. Um, it's a lot of fun. Oh, okay. Yes, what, what an interesting time. Yeah. Um, it was really exciting, I think, uh, making those choices. Um, I think it's such a fantastic grounding to do almost any career, to have a liberal arts degree. Thanks. I had something that, so history in France, you spent a year living in France where they couldn't really understand that if you were studying history, you might go on to be a diplomat or a banker or something else. You're on a road as soon as you pick a subject in France. <laughs> yeah, if you want to be a diplomat in France, then you should study law and international relations. Whereas my colleagues have engineering degrees and chemistry degrees, and old English, you know, whatever. Um, I don't think there's a set one. So 30 of us joined at the same time, and so a lot of people might have read politics, philosophy, and economics. For example, the classic politician's degree um, at Oxford. But, but as I say, one colleague's an engineer, um, some science is there. It's not obvious that you have to have the foundation. But when you need to make people They do now, I think. About 10 years ago, it was rarer. I think the financial crisis sort of made a master's almost obligatory. One, is something to do after your undergrad, and two, to... Because as more and more people do it, it raises the cost of you not doing it, as you seek employment, I suppose. But it's quite striking. I joined the Foreign Service a few years ago, having done other things for about six years, but there are colleagues there who are 21 straight after the undergraduate degree. I might have to just get around you for a second. Uh, yeah, you're right. Um, once per day. Okay.
Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Liam Flaherty, and I'm a senior here at Tufts University and a member of this year's Epic Colloquium. And I'll be moderating this morning's panel on nationalism and populism. Over the past two years, we have seen election res results in the West that have shaken the established political institutions to their core and have challenged some of the most basic assumptions about the trajectory, tra trajectory and longevity of international governance as we know it. Serious divisions over how world order ought to be formed and who should be entrusted with it have begun to show their face in Western body politics. The teleological narrative of ever-increasing freedom and prosperity through a greater implementation of liberal policies and practices is no longer as easily sold as real and perceived living standards degrade and stagnate beyond foreseeable remedy among those segments of society that have been left behind. There is a serious loss of faith among large sections of the society of the desirability of this grand ideological project and the legitimacy of those entrusted with it, 
spawning a retrogression into the chauvinist nationalist politics that many believed were left in the past. In the words of Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung, the individual's <coughs> feeling of weakness, indeed of non-existence, is compensated by the eruption of hitherto unknown desires for power. It is the revolt of the powerless, the insatiable greed of the have-not. There is a real perception that the voices of the many have been silenced so as to maintain a political status quo that is not only not in their interests, but actively undermining them. This sense of usurpation of a system that nominally owes its primary allegiance to the people has been pitted against those who they perceive as usurping it. Under this lens, the populace appears not as a tyrant, but as a king finally come home. In order to participate productively in this discussion, we need to be critical of these aforementioned populist narratives, as well as critical of the liberal narrative and whatever ones we use to insulate our own worldviews. We ask those with us today, both sitting at the podium and in the audience, to keep in mind three fundamental questions as we engage in our discussion. Why are citizens increasingly preferring candidates and policies that could only be described as populist? How consequential are these trends on the international order? And what can and ought we as individuals and societies do to respond to it? So here with us today, we have um, here with us today, we have Mark Bailey, Deputy Head of the Political Section at the British Embassy in Washington and form former Foreign Affairs Assistant to the United Kingdom's Prime Minister, Theresa May. Um, and we have Professor Packer here with us again tonight, uh, this morning. Um, and up on the screen, we have, um, on your right, we have Ted Pacone, a uh, Senior Fellow in the Project on International Order and Strategy and Latin American Initiative in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution, and Michael Lind, author and co-founder of the think tank New America. The panel will be an hour and a half long. Each speaker will be given 12 minutes to make opening remarks. They will then have an opportunity to ask each other questions and challenge each other's points, followed by a discussion que question from myself and a period, period of audience questions where participants from the <coughs> audience can stand up to one of the two microphones and uh, will be given a maximum six of 60 seconds to ask one question specifically addressed to one of the panelists. Um, if you could wait with me for just a second as uh, I prompt Michael Lynn to begin his uh, remarks. I think that narrative is, is mistaken, 
is the narrative of the center left and the center right establishment parties. I think uh, the more accurate narrative is that the real break would be post-1945 domestic social settlements within Western countries, uh, and also with the uh, world order that the Euro-American societies had been familiar with. Uh, that break took place in the 1990s, at the end of the Cold War. So what is being challenged now, uh, in the second decade of the 21st century, is not a, a, a system that goes back to the post-1945 years. It's a system that goes back to the 1990s and has been constructed relatively recently in the 1990s and the 2000s. Now, it, and it's called neoliberalism. I'm not, I don't really like that word because it's used by some people to mean uh, the center left turned towards markets in the 1990s and 2000s. The other views are just mean capitalism, which kind of makes it pointless. But, but let's call it neoliberalism. Uh, the defining uh, basis of neoliberalism was globalization. It was the uh, entry into what had been extremely uh, protected uh, labor markets in Europe and America uh, of both uh, the populations and the forces of developing countries uh, like uh, India and China, uh, which uh, had previously pursued import substitution policies. They've been protectionist, or in the case of China, they've been Marxist, Leninist, uh, communist uh, economies. So suddenly the global workforce that's available to Western-based corporations vastly expanded uh, in the 1990s and 2000s, and and multinationals, most of which are based in uh, North America or Western Europe, uh, have taken advantage of this by means of what is called global arbitrage, that is uh, offshoring in some cases, uh, in importing not only immigrants, but also non-immigrant guest workers. Uh, for example, H-1B holders uh, were very important in the US uh, tech industry. Uh, and we always must distinguish guest workers from immigrants. Guest workers are not immigrants. Legally, they do not have the right to become citizens unless they, they change their status. They belong to a separate category. Uh, so what has happened is this uh, uh, globalization of production with uh, corporations transferring mostly their low and middle scale production uh, operations uh, to places like South China, uh, to uh, call centers, and in the case of loan services in India. This has coincided with a uh, radical change in the class structure and the occupational structure uh, in North America and Western Europe, it's, and the, which are very similar on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, there's a shrinkage of the manufacturing uh, proletariat of, of the industrial workers. There is a slight expansion of uh, college-educated professionals, it's up to about 30% of the US population now has, a, even, has a, at least a bachelor's degree or more, and, and it's similar in Western Europe. Uh, and then between these two groups, there's been a, a substantial growth of certain sector workers, uh, mostly in uh, healthcare, recreation, and leisure, uh, and retail, uh, many of the very poor paid and part of what is called a, a precariat. Now, uh, scholars debate the contribution of globalization to uh, the deindustrialization and the, the reduction of the number of manufacturing jobs in particular. For a long time, offshoring was kind of dismissed by uh, a bunch of the establishment as a major contributor to the loss of manufacturing jobs in the US and also in Europe. New data by David Autor uh, and other economists show that, that the impact was much greater uh, than people realized. But nevertheless, the, the point remains that uh, uh, although this has hurt manufacturing workers to some degree and, and some service sector workers, the majority of people uh, have not competed directly either with uh, workers in offshore production uh, uh, areas or with uh, immigrants uh, who tend to compete with the less educated natives in Western societies, at least the, the unskilled immigrants, if you can set aside uh, skilled uh, immigrants and guest workers. Uh, 
Uh, so, so in that case, there's a narrative that globalization actually has not, it does not have very much to do with this transformation of the occupational and class system within the Western countries. It's mainly a matter of technology, not uh, offshore and immigration. Uh, that's true to some degree, uh, but I think it underestimates uh, the extent to which uh, offshoring in particular by weakening the industrial uh, workforce has uh, crippled two of the institutions which acted uh, as forces, as countervailing powers against uh, the influence of business and financial elites in the West. Uh, one was trade unions, which historically were concentrated in the manufacturing sector in the US and Europe. The other uh, is social democratic parties parties of the left, which until fairly recently had the native uh, white working classes of Western Europe and North America as their core constituency. Uh, and what, what has happened is uh, the, the trade unions, they're stronger in, in Europe than they are in the United States. The United States private sector trade unions are almost extinct. Uh, the, the trade union market is, in the U.S. is dominated by uh, uh, fairly well uh, uh, educated, college educated uh, professionals, teachers, and other public civil servants. Uh, the social democratic parties, I think you have to look to their implosion uh, in order to understand the rise of populism and nationalism in Europe and America because as uh, they have shed a lot of the native working class to parties either of the populist right or of the uh, neo socialist. Uh, in some cases, you know, communists left, uh, largely to cast protest votes vis-a-vis uh, 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 disgruntled former industrial workers and their families and communities. Uh, what has happened is the so-called left has reconfigured itself uh, as uh, a kind of hourglass coalition of uh, uh, affluent and educated native whites in uh, the U.S. and uh, Europe, often in the United cities, metropolitan areas, uh, along with uh, ethnic minorities, both uh, long resident native uh, and immigrants. Uh, so we were seeing a completely different political pattern from the one that existed up until a decade or two, uh, with the uh, big cities on both sides of the Atlantic having these uh, coalitions of upscale whites and minorities, uh, and then the uh, suburban areas and rural areas. Uh, where, uh, which are home not really to rural people, there aren't that many farmers anymore in the Western world, uh, but to the uh, uh, former industrial workers uh, being the new base. Uh, and uh, the, the protectionism versus globalization and free trade regime, the uh, metropolitan intelligentsia portrays this as good versus evil. Uh, I'm not taking sides in the Fine, uh, but let me just end with this one observation. Labor is geographically immobile. Uh, uh, capital is not. Uh, so there's always going to be affinity for working classes which are rooted in particular communities to resist both offshoring and to the extent that it, it uh, affects their incomes, uh, immigration. So this is a clash of interests, not really values. Um, thank you, Michael Lind. Um, next, we'll begin with um, Mark Bailey. Thanks very much. Um, so I, just to uh, start off, um, I wanted to thank, obviously, uh, Tufts for the, and the IGL for the invitation. Um, and just to clarify, as officials will want to do, that I'm speaking more in a personal capacity. Um, I spend more time pushing papers as a bureaucrat than uh, publishing them. So uh, my remarks will be in that spirit. Um, I wanted to talk, um, first of all, about what we really mean by a resurgence of nationalism. And to be sure, we're not conflating different phenomena and reaching an overly pessimistic conclusion. But accepting, as we've heard from Michael, that there has been an uptick in nationalist and populist sentiment, um, I'll also look at what's been causing it, arguing that people do have legitimate concerns and that governments need to take care not to dismiss them too readily. And then finally, I'll look at what we ought to do about it. So what are we talking about when we talk of resurgence of nationalism? Should we accept the premise? Um, there are obviously co complex causes and consequences. We've heard a little about the causes, uh, and I think we'll turn to the consequences soon. But I think it's worth laboring the point and being clear on what we mean. 
Um, we've already heard a little uh, mention of Brexit, and I think probably one of the reasons I was invited here today uh, was out of curiosity about that vote. So let me dive right into that. Um, the UK helped to forge the liberal international order. It was present at the creation, a signatory of the Atlantic Charter of 41, the co-architect of Bretton Woods, the host of the very first meeting of the UN General Assembly in London in 1946. So in voting to leave the EU, if we take this as a case study, has Britain now abandoned its belief in liberal internationalism? Has one of the founder members of the post-war system simply lost its faith? I pose this question, I think, to encourage us all to take care of what we're talking about. Um, certainly, the decision by the British people in June 2016 was unexpected in many quarters. It was seen by many as a rejoinder to the march of multilateralism. But, as you might expect, I'd argue that's a simplification and error if we conflate it with a rejection of liberal internationalism. Just look, for example, at our Prime Minister's latest speech in Davos, underlining that a rules-based international order is the crucial foundation for international peace and prosperity. And at Munich, several weeks later, she celebrated the fact that Britain remains the only country in the world to spend 0.7% on development and 2% on defence, that we're more committed than ever to our responsibilities as a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council and in NATO, and that as we leave the EU, we'll be seeking um, an expanded security partnership with the European Union. Yesterday, in a new speech, she explained that not only does the UK want a far-reaching trade agreement with the uh, European Union, but we also seek to champion the benefits of free trade for the wider international system. So I run through this to kind of question the premise of whether populist nationalism um, is as obvious a phenomenon as we might think. Um, we should distinguish carefully um, and avoid, I think, conflating different data points uh, and finding ourselves in an unnecessarily pessimistic place. Um, so if that is happening, though, um, if there are clearly are expanding vote shares and uh, appeals by uh, the populist left and the nationalist right, uh, what are the causes? It's clear that something has changed since the heady days of the 1990s and early 2000s when scholars mused on the end of history um, and institutional and normative developments led to innovations as diverse as the European single currency and the responsibility to protect um, it's empirically evident that, um, as Michael has been discussing, the dislocating effects of globalization um, have been seen in the rise of populist parties and in the vote shares. Uh, it's taken various forms, and the solutions I'll turn to uh, look more the legitimate crisis of insecurity. Uh, I'd add, as an aside, that where the spectre of neo-fascism raises its head, we ought to be far more strident and instantaneous in our rebuttal. So some thoughts from me on the origins of the trend. First, as solutions um, have increasingly been sought across borders, electorates have balked at the apparently more complicated challenge of holding their leaders to account and their inability to provide solutions within states. The perception of Brussels as a faraway and unaccountable seat of government is not a uniquely British perception. Long-standing trends suggest that the bond between vote and representative frays with every level of remove and is an inherent challenge for international institutions, especially those charged with technocratic mandates. In my new beat to covering US politics, I was struck uh, attending the National Governors Association in Washington last week by two things. First, that the governors we met were obsessed with the technical detail of inward investment opportunities, workforce development plans, and innovation agendas. They all seemed in a real hurry to get things done. And second, I'd suggest as a consequence, their approval ratings are far, far higher uh, than Congress's, for example. And your governor here in Massachusetts has an approval in the mid-60s and Congress's languishes in the teens. The trust deficit in government has been accelerated by globalization and the inability of national leaders to deliver speedy solutions. But there are other causes. We live in an era of hyper-connectivity and instant gratification. And we expect solutions quickly and can organize through virtual networks to voice our discontent and have it reaffirmed when it doesn't happen. And just as our leaders must face up to this challenge, so too must CEOs, law enforcement agencies, media organizations, NGOs, even diplomats. Um, I want to be clear, though, uh, I guess this is my central point, that those who think they've been shortchanged do have a point. We ask why the liberal narrative is losing its appeal to the Western body politic, <laughs> as if its bounty should be self-evident to people. But a, a narrative is one thing, and lived experience is another. So to illustrate the point that people really are being left behind, they're not just imagining it, let's look at a few examples. It's undoubtedly true that free movement of people within the EU and who, huge flows of migrants from less developed member states to countries like the UK, while beneficial to our economy as a whole, 
put downward pressure on incomes in certain sectors, especially in skilled and semi-skilled professions like plumbing or construction. It's also true that governments have generally done too little to explain to people why once great industries can no longer prosper and too little to help those employed in those industries transition into new livelihoods. And I often hear uh, in the United States talking to those active in local politics that some of the biggest challenges that affect more downtrodden communities like the opioid crisis have received too little attention from the top. So we should be honest that there's been a certain complacency in the West as globalization drove growth, but without too much consideration for how the proceeds of that growth were being distributed. Um, our Prime Minister put this well in her speech this week when she said that the UK's referendum result on the EU was a vote for a wider change so that no community in Britain would ever be left behind again. Alongside the complacency in some quarters, there has, let's be honest, um, been a certain elitism, which has sparked an understandable reaction. If the question is about the liberal international narrative and why it's failing, maybe it's because it's a narrative pitched only to liberal internationalists. Um, resentments grow when people feel locked out of generally prospering societies, dividing people by generation, region, and economic success. And I think we should be honest, there's, there's been a tone of condescension by those doing well, often directed at those who aren't and who feel resentments, and those resentments manifest themselves in the ways we're discussing. Uh, the situation isn't helped by the echo chambers we've increasingly retreated into. 30 years ago, most Americans or Brits uh, read the same local newspaper and sat down to watch the same nightly news broadcast. Today, there's a panoply of media to choose from, but most of us on whatever side are drawn to commentary by those sympathetic to our existing worldviews. So I say again, those who are preaching the liberal narrative are preaching to the converted. One final point on the drivers of populism is the enduring relevance of the nation state, both as the organizing element of the international system, but also as a fulcrum for identity. Paradoxically, as the primacy of the nation state has been increasingly challenged by international institutionalism, as well as by direct collaboration between non-state actors, people have sought the reassurance um, of the nation state and the, the concept of the nation itself, including through nationalism. We know that changing interests can help change identities. But for that transformation to take place, people need to be convinced that their interests have actually changed. However rational the formation of supranational communities to solve collective problems, I'd suggest that people's identities aren't likely to change if no one is bothered to make a tailored case that international cooperation serves the specific and tailored needs of the individual and their community. So, having recognised that people have a point, what should governments do about it? First, they need to tell a more convincing story about the benefits of liberal internationalism. Adherence to a liberal international order and its components needs to be a dynamic process, a contract regularly updated between nation state and citizen. It isn't good enough to tell voters they should accept global public goods that come from the post-war order and be grateful for them. It requires informed consent and a recognition of disaggregated needs, not just of general well-being. It also requires leaders to think carefully about how to tailor their arguments and their concrete offer to national circumstances. One last quote from our Prime Minister uh, on our relationship with the EU. She said that people, uh, perhaps because of our history and geography, the EU never felt to us like an integral part of our national story in a way it does to many elsewhere in Europe. I think those who were leading the Remain campaign in the UK didn't tell a positive enough tailored story to go convince people that a membership of the EU was in their interests. So we should learn these lessons when it comes to free trade, which is a hot topic of conversation in Washington and elsewhere this weekend. We need honest, open conversations about trade, which build the case to a broad swathe of communities, not deals which bring aggregate benefit, and like TTIP in Europe, are pursued in people's best interests, whether those people agree that they stand to benefit or not. This will mean that future deals will need concrete provisions on worker and environmental protection. Second, it follows we have to get away from the idea that the right narrative alone is a panacea. A narrative will only work if it's founded on concrete action. Governments need to make genuine efforts to reinvigorate parts of the economy and areas of their country that have been left behind during the rapid advance of globalization in the past 30 years. Examples in my own country include our government's pursuit of new economic hubs outside the capital, the northern powerhouse around Manchester and Leeds, and the Midlands engine around Birmingham and the West Midlands. These projects need to be complemented by workforce development plans, as I heard from the governors, as well as in initiatives like the infrastructure package being discussed in Washington. It strikes me that economic con uh, connectivity hasn't necessarily kept pace with social connectivity, and without a recalibration, popular solutions will continue to meet an enthusiastic reception.
Third, part of recalibrating the pact between governors and the governed is to think carefully about where power can most usefully be transferred and where that can happen downwards, not just upwards. In theory, the EU works on this concept. Subsidiarity is the term that dictates that the most appropriate level of government, local, regional, national, supranational, should have competence over a given issue, but it often hasn't felt that way to people in practice. So again, in the UK, we are radically redistributing power through the formation of six new metropolitan mayoralities, new mayors with unprecedented powers that are taking up office in cities like Manchester, Liverpool, and Birmingham. And increasingly, mayors, governors, and other subnational leaders will work together to form their, form their own cooperative international relations to the benefit of those they serve. And climate change is a great example here in the United States where many individual states are leaving the, leading away. Regional leaders are often the best equipped to pinpoint uh, their own economic value proposition. National governments should be helping to facilitate those links and see it as an opportunity. Fourth, don't forget leadership. Uh, both in forging the new narrative and in delivering the, forms, the reforms which will make it credible, leadership matters. In 2017, nowhere was watched more closely than France by those fearing an advance and the final triumph of populist nationalism. Instead, Emmanuel Macron understood that the traditional left-right divides had been superseded in his country by those for and against globalization in its current form, and he seized the initiative, making a patriotic case for openness. I'd argue, too, that Prime Minister Theresa May has confounded those who suggested that Brexit was a vote for Britain to turn inwards and away from the world, and by, she, set, um, she set out, I think, instead, a bold internationalist interpretation of the referendum grounded in Britain's sense of responsibility on the global stage. So, in essence, leadership matters and individuals matter, and through this, democracies, far more than their authoritarian competitors, have a knack for reinvention. Last point, um, a final word on the liberal order. I think it's fashionable in some quarters to think there's an increasing tension between liberalism and order that to prevent the kind of instability that post-war institutions were set up to forestall, we'll have to abandon our values. But it's precisely the fact that those institutions were infused with liberal values that have made them so successful, that has delivered historically low levels of violence, incredible strides towards eradicating poverty, and advances in indi individual liberty in many corners of the world. It's true that the West must hold together, and that's not always easy, but the task at hand, through addressing its domestic deficiencies and taking the case boldly to the world, world, wider world, is to reform the international order for the decades ahead, not to lose our nerve precisely when the stakes are highest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Now we move on to Professor Packer. Well, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me a second time, uh, which Dr. Williams did yesterday, uh, only because of the difficulties of composing uh, this panel with people sitting up front and not leaving Mark on his own with, with uh, you, Liam. Uh, so uh, let me just preface my remarks by saying uh, I was not anticipating being on this panel. So uh, I'm gonna, just going to share some reflections which largely come out of my professional experience, and I think the reason Dr. Williams invited me here is because I spent about 10 years as uh, uh, the Senior Legal Advisor and Director of the Office of the High Commission on National Minorities in the OSCE, working on these issues in the 1990s. Uh, in the context of the bloody dissolution of the former Yugoslavia, this was the great concern. People, you're, you're too young to remember, but there are people in this room who will remember <clears throat> how Tuchman and Milosevic and uh, Itzegabevich uh, suddenly turned almost on a dime from socialism as the uh, prevailing uh, political project uh, under Tito to nationalism uh, and the historic uh, ambitions of the Croats, the Serbs, and then they invented the Bosniaks. Uh, just as a matter of fact, I don't know if anyone's here from former Yugoslavia, uh, but for your information, Muslim in, this, uh, in the former Federated Socialist uh, Republic of Yugoslavia was a nationality and not a religion because, of course, it was a secular socialist society. So uh, even just to understand the paradigm and the terminology to be quite uh, 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 clear about it, and therefore they constructed almost immediately the notion of Bosniak. Uh, and, uh, and if you read Benedict Anderson's uh, great work on imagined communities, this idea of construction of any political project, but specifically nationalism, is very much an imagined, particularly its ethno-cultural aspect. Now, it's also problematical. And, uh, and why is it problematical? And I'll t in my view, uh, straight off to say uh, that the, the idea of an ism, a political philosophy and project uh, centered around the nation, or, uh, um, and, and we'll come to populism in a moment, uh, 
uh, is by its uh, nature conflict generating. It's a hierarchical philosophical structure, the nation above all, Deutschland über alles. Uh, so that means, and uh, for the Americans in the audience, just think a little bit, America first means what to non-Americans? It means we're not first. <laughs> it means we're second, third, fifth, twelfth. This is problematical uh, in terms of any kind of relationships or structure. So if it's a nation above all, then this is conflict generating and actually not reconcilable. You're not going to be able to deal with the really existing complex interdependence I mentioned yesterday, uh, issues of environment, issues of uh, uh, health. You know, we live in a world now which is so interrelated. You know, how come uh, Ebola, uh, Ebola was a threat to America? How ridiculous is that? But it's not ridiculous. It's very real because we are really integrated globally. Economically, even more so. Uh, it's some years now that, uh, ago that I read uh, that there's only something like 90 days uh, of food supply in the world at any one time. We have a highly integrated uh, agricultural economy of the world, tra trading. And similarly for all sorts of other, uh, uh, other um, dependencies economically. And you know, there are those who uh, have complained, like Malaysia, which complained about Soros manipulating uh, the currency markets because in seconds, instantaneously, pressing a button, we can transfer total wealth or large, amazing amounts of, of wealth capital uh, across frontiers and so forth. The dependency of it is remarkable. Currency fluctuations and so forth. So just to say that we really are living in this complex and interdependent world for which a paradigm of, uh, of simplistic reductionist com competition of nations uh, is not going to actually solve those problems. Now that's without asking the question, so what's a nation? Now, nation, incidentally, and uh, Mark mentioned nation state. This is a term you hear in places like Fletcher. It's not a term of law. Nation state is a 19th century construction. It didn't exist uh, before that. And according to A.C. Grayling and many other people, it ain't going to exist a lot longer. We're in the death throes. Well, we can argue that. There's certainly, Professor Rock mentioned yesterday, the diminishment in the number of uh, democracies. The counterpoint of the diminishment of the numbers of democracies is the rise of new nationalist uh, states. You know, we've got a long list of them all around the world. Uh, you know, Modi in, in India, uh, exactly contrary to uh, the formation of India as a non-Hindustan, uh, for example, to overcome the diversity that really exists in that amazingly richly diverse state. But we could talk about Turkey making uh, um, uh, Erdogan agreeing, uh, uh, making a deal with the Nationalist Party uh, just last week. Uh, and really, we can talk about m many, many countries. And I'm not just talking about the little countries like Hungary, uh, uh, Poland, forgive Poland for, me for saying little country, but relatively speaking, uh, uh, if we look at the big countries that are now pursuing this kind of nationalist, and I would add America. If you read Timothy Garden Nash and others, it's not just America, which some, what's curious in this is America and France, of course, with, this, with the countries that projected a new identity, the idea of the civic, the state based on equal citizens, not on an ethno-national or other culturally defined uh, character uh, uh, of belonging. Uh, and, and now, uh, to present an alternative to that, that's highly problematical. Who's the good American if the American is now defined in ethnocultural or uh, other terms? I English only laws, I'll mention uh, many other uh, problem aspects of it. I can mention my own country in this, of Canada. We, we've, uh, Professor Rock and I know that we've suffered long through the Canadian identity crisis. We're not really sure who a Canadian is unless we're talking about the kind of legal basis, a Canadian citizen or persons within the jurisdiction of Canada, and then we know what the law applies and so forth. But we don't seek to reduce that to a we-they paradigm, an either-or. We have a little bit of it, binationalism as a paradigm that uh, Pierre Trudeau uh, brought forth, but now we're already in a problematical discussion about nation-to-nation-to-nation -to -nation -to -nation discussions. We're not sure who those other nations are, and, and within them a, a lot of complexity. So, so this is problematical. Now, in the, in the current uh, uh, terms, uh, let's just uh, unpack a little bit this idea of uh, nationalism. The reduction of it almost always ends up being uh, ethnoculturally defined. Paradigms of the kind of idealized, uh, 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 symbolic person of the nation. Uh, so we come to this notion of purity. Who's the really good Armenian? Who's the pure Armenian? I would like to submit to you that that itself is also a mythology. There is no pure any human being. Uh, I am also incidentally also a British citizen, 
and, uh, and my uh, wife and, and uh, children are also French citizens and also Belgian citizens. My children have the possibility of five citizenships. They were born in the Netherlands and partly raised in the Netherlands. Uh, but if we talk about being British, you want to tell me what it is to be, and how about English? You know, commonly, the Brits are known, or the English in particular, is the mongrel or bastard nation. Because we don't know what a really good, pure Englishman is. And, and, and one of the great uh, advantages of the development of a dynamic British uh, society was we didn't try to define it. We didn't try to actually uh, pocket hole people in, into uh, imagined ideas. Now, we, this is not me, John, suggesting to you that this is problematical. Anybody here re read Mein Kampf? Anybody else read Mein Kampf? Couple of us, huh? If you remember, about the first hundred pages of it is basically a description of what was wrong at the time. I forget the year it was written, 1924 or something like that. I can't remember the year. But basically a litany of all sorts of problems. And then around page 106 or something, you turn the page and out of nowhere, Hitler comes, or whoever wrote it, Hitler comes with this, ah, it's the Jews. This turn to, and then of course you end up, the whole rest of the book is essentially a catalog of German chauvinism and nationalism and a, a real uh, elaborated hatred and a hierarchy of the other. And the Jews were first, but the Jews were not the only ones. You know, the Holocaust was not only about the Jews. And actually the elimination, the final solution started with those useless people, the disabled, and then went on to other groups, gays, lesbians, others, long litany. So we know from history that nationalism is not only an uh, um, ill-conceived notion, it ends badly. We know that. So that's not a conjecture. So this idea of not only uh, my nation above others, but the need to have others, the paradigm of we and they, and the hierarchy of it, and the others who are the scapegoats, those are the ones who are the cause of our problems. Mexican immigrant laborers. The fact that they're doing all sorts of lousy jobs and so forth, or maybe not. They might be your doctor too, by the way. But it's very easy to have this reduction. There must be somebody who's taken my job or caused my uh, uh, insecurity and so forth. Uh, so this combination leads to, uh, uh, leads to uh, frankly, uh, war. Uh, by the way, the, just go back to the myth of purity. Uh, I, I just a little footnote. I love the ironies of history. You know who, who, uh, who formed France? It was a Corsican. Who formed Italy? Uh, Sardinian, Garibaldi. Uh, who formed, you know, e even you go to the Soviet Union and the author of the Nationalities Question, 1913, Stalin, who was a Georgian. Uh, Hitler, a little Austrian, far from being an Aryan, a short, little, dark-haired guy who was pretty weak and couldn't, you know, survive his arts class frustrated little guy from Austria, became the kind of leader of the, the Reich and the German, uh, the Aryan race nation. How ironic, how ironic. But it resonates because they were playing on the popular insecurities, and this is the link with populism. The insecurities, the uncertainties, we look at the origin of populism in this country in the 19th, uh, end of the 19th century. And the, uh, it was already mentioned about uh, agrarian, uh, the losers at the time. The great fear, uh, which of course then gained uh, much, uh, uh, much more strength uh, after the First World War and after the Great Depression. But actually was picked up even in some of the notion of Woodrow Wilson's famous 14 points and every nation shall have its home. A, a reductionist idea. A kind of justice. But not very well thought through. Go, go and speak with the Hungarians about what they think about Trianon and so forth. Very problematical. So I would like to suggest to you that we have to think a different way. We have to acknowledge that we live in a complicated world uh, where uh, we ourselves, look at, our, look at yourself. Think about your own history, relationships, and so forth. That doesn't reduce to a simple we, they. Uh, and think about how others would think if you project that upon them. Exclusionary, disadvantages, advantages. Language and so forth brought into policies become mediators of opportunity. It's basically what Pierre Trudeau did in Canada. English had been a mediator of opportunity of Canada. A large part of our population at the time, about 25%, was largely excluded from opportunities in the federal civil service and so forth. Simple solution there was let's adopt bilingualism. Immediately that choice by officializing uh, both languages gave immediate opportunity to francophones. And francophones now are actually uh, 
more than equally represented in things like the federal civil service. That's a deal. That's a part of it because people see the consequences. They can relate to them. They think, okay, what would be fair in that regard? And that, that cut off a populism at that time in our country, which was uh, a Quebec independent uh, movement. It's a new deal for our country as a whole. Um, there's much more I could say about this, but I would just suggest and really appeal to you to, to think this through. What are the, uh, for those of you who might find some resonance in America First, I don't know if you've seen all the short little comic skits done across the world on, you know, can we be second? I think it was a Dutch journalist who started, or, or host, you know, can we, at least can we be second? And then they mock, you know, you know, the Dutch say, well, at least they're not the Danes, you know, and then you get into this kind of humor and so forth. But they're really mocking the idea, the projection, and, there's, and they're really appealing. They're saying, please, don't go down that route. We know where it ends. Thank you, Professor Packer. We will shortly begin with Ted Picone's remarks. start then. I can't, I'm having some technological problems, uh, but I will try to get through my uh, remarks here in a somewhat smooth fashion. Um, I may come in and out of the screen, uh, but as long as you can hear me, I will go through uh, my points here. Um, we are, I want to, I really appreciate the comments that have been made so far, and thank you uh, again for the conference organizers to invite me. Um, and I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Um, I, I wanted to focus in on some of the conceptual issues that we're talking through here today um, and start with uh, the issue of populism um, and, and why populism and nationalism, and in particular the combination of the two, pose such a threat to the international liberal order. So populism, uh, because it claims majoritarian rule should prevail with only limited checks and balances is particularly threatening to the international liberal order, which rests on fundamental norms of equality, mutual respect, and enlightened self-interest. So in this sense, populism is a direct challenge to the core principles of, in particular, the international human rights system, uh, which are founded on the belief that every individual has certain inalienable rights that the state cannot deny them, regardless of majoritarian views. So I really appreciate what Professor Packer just had to say about uh, the worries of uh, ethno-nationalism and, and what it can lead to in terms of conflict. So if you think about it in, in stark terms, um, if, if I'm a nonviolent Kurd in Turkey, or a Uyghur Muslim in China, or a Rohingya Muslim in Myanmar, my rights are often denied or curtailed by this really brutal assertion of majority rule. Now, nationalism, I think, is a little more complicated in, in this context. Um, it's not necessarily incompatible with the international liberal order. I would argue that it depends on what kind of nationalism is asserted and by what kind of state. Uh, so nation states in our current system, of course, can and should defend their interests and values internationally. And if you think about our traditional definitions of national sovereignty and self-determination and non-interference in internal affairs, kind of the bedrock elements of the United Nations, these serve as guardrails for protecting each other 
from aggression and overt, and as we've seen more recently, covert attacks by external enemies. I'm thinking when I say covert attacks, subversive uh, propaganda uh, and interference in, in elections. And, and that type of uh, national interest is it, it, fair enough. Um, but the problem with the America First and other more narrow interpretations of nationalism is that you have at the global, there are two kinds. One is at the global governance table. It's full of highly diverse states with very different political systems. So immediately you have a question about, about legitimacy. If you think about the opening words of the UN Charter, it refers to we the peoples. But there is no place for popular sovereignty in New York. There's no vertical accountability other than through government representatives. Um, and only about half of those government representatives represent liberal representative democratic system. So there's a, a real problem with uh, legitimacy. The other half of the member states claim some form of popular legitimacy is, is bestowed on them by some kind of revolutionary or religious creed or monarchical bloodline. And I have to say as a side note, ironically, many of these same governments call for what they say, democratization of global governance, uh, when they themselves are very far away from exercising what we would recognize as democracy in their own, in their own countries. The, the other problem with uh, narrow na nationalism it, is that if everyone pursued their own national interests without regard for their neighbors or the common good, then as Professor Packer pointed out, competition turns into conflict. Um, so nationalism in, in today's context, after many, many years of globalization, is, is full of contradictions when we look at it from a liberal perspective. Um, and if you, if you think about the founding of the UN and the many uh, years since, we have this inherently weak foundation of diverse political systems at the foot of the pyramid, at the foot of the global governance system. And the victors of World War II and, and many non-aligned states from Asia, Latin America, and Africa built up an architecture of liberal institutions and rules to check national sovereignty and foster the kind of international cooperation we need to avoid war, to support human development, to respect human rights and the environment, etc. So bit by bit, uh, this system of nation states is constructed uh, what I would consider a, a fairly constructive and positive uh, system of responsible sovereignty, or another term might be contained nationalism. And if you think about the, the array of institutions we have in the mix in, in that space, um, at one spectrum, maybe the most advanced, uh, sit institutions like the International Criminal Court, the World Trade Organization, the European Court of Justice. We have doctrines, responsibility to protect in human security, humanitarian intervention, um, which have had their uh, ups and downs and pros and cons, but this all came from a sentiment that we need to control nationalism and, and national sovereignty um, and insert it with a sense of fundamental uh, norms and uh, rules that check, uh, you know, the abuses that have, we know from history. So you think about the treaties that prohibit certain types of weapons and chemicals that harm people and harm the environment. These are in place and mostly respected. Or look at the European Union, the epitome of pooled sovereignty for the sake of more ambitious goals mm -hmm. of securing peace, of widening prosperity, consolidating the rule of law. So in this sense, nationalism is recast in, in terms of win-win solutions for addressing problems of uh, the regional or global commons. The problem is that it does suffer, as, as other speakers have pointed out, from being an elite-driven bureaucratic process uh, that has created these rules, uh, but populist and, and nationalists are, of course, exploiting as uh, undemocratic and un unfair. So we have 
this kind of uh, contained nationalism in contrast to uh, uh, the kind of more unconditional or zero-sum national sovereignty that President Trump is, is pushing, uh, which I think is a direct threat to the United States' own interests in leading the international liberal order. And it's the combination of the two, the, the populist narrative with the return of this more traditional nationalism that, that poses the main threats to, to the international liberal order. Um, so if you think about who, who are they attacking, what, where are the main threats uh, they perceive, uh, populist nationalists, uh, certainly migration would be number one on the list. This perception of uncontrolled migration, of people coming in, taking jobs away, um, bringing crime, bringing drugs. Uh, this is, uh, I think, what's really roiling our democratic politics uh, in, in Europe and the United States. A second issue would be free trade. Uh, and the kind of free trade that, while it has had its winners, and I would say not just the elite, but many, many uh, lower and middle classes that have benefited from cheaper goods. Uh, but it has certainly brought along uh, many losers of globalization, and they've not been compensated fairly. And then a third category would be, uh, I think particularly in the US view, uh, restrictions on unfettered exploitation of natural resources, <coughs> oil, and gas, et cetera. Um, and that we need to fuel our industries. So if you think about these three areas, migration, trade, and climate change, the Trump administration um, believes that we must reverse course, uh, and this means, in terms of the international liberal order, uh, undermining our own international obligations to protect refugees, uh, and instead build border walls, impose new tariffs, abandon the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and encourage even more uh, development and use of coal and other carbon uh, emitting fuels. Um, and, and to be fair, I don't mean just to uh, 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 criticize Trump on this. This brand of anti-internationalism has a long track record in the United States. Uh, if you think about our, our long-standing failure to ratify treaties like the Law of the Seas, or on protecting disabled people. Um, these are treaties which are manifestly in the US national interest. Uh, the Dis Disabilities Treaty is based on US law. Um, and these are two good examples of this irrational fear of losing control of our, of our national sovereignty. And I would say turning to Europe, uh, the rise of populist nationalism is, is also eating away at the main underpinnings of the European Union. Uh, I mean, Brexit is the most obvious example, but the rise of the far right and far left populists, much more on the far right, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, it is likely to lead to real constraints on the European Union's ability, uh, both to play a leading role in sustaining the EU's own process of integration and in the EU's ability to play a leading role in the world and in um, sustaining the, the wider international liberal order. Uh, just a couple more points. Uh, let's go a step further and imagine what this wholesale populist nationalist assault on the international liberal order would look like. In, in my view, just to focus specifically on going back to the issue of human rights, this would be uh, a primary target for, uh, for this community. Um, so even though human rights is one of the three main pillars of the international liberal order, it's already in a weak position. It's always been seen as the poor cousin to you know, the resources and the development community, the attention-grabbing uh, domains of, of security, peacekeeping, etc. cetera. Um, so populists argue that the human rights treaties, uh, enshrining of equality and non-discrimination and minority rights are, are really unnecessary constraints on majority rule. Uh, nationalists argue that elite-dominated bodies composed of unelected judges and bureaucrats and international lawyers have no business telling us what we can do within our sovereign borders. And, and the fact that the United States and, and the European Union have the kind of popular legitimacy I've referred to before, 
that comes from being liberal democracies, you know, I think this actually strengthens their, their argument. Um, so my fear is that bit by bit, international norms uh, on human rights will be ignored, will be violated and undermined, as they already are so tragically in places like Syria and Myanmar and in South Sudan. Or if you think of it in, in, in kind of smaller terms, the, the populist ruler of Turkey uh, rejects decisions of the European Court of Justice that he doesn't like. Um, or, or even in a democratic Costa Rica, populist politicians are winning votes by rejecting the recent inter-American court's decision to uphold LGBT rights. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, our veto-wielding states on the UN Security Council, like China and Russia, blocking any serious attempt to hold uh, abusers accountable for violating international law, particularly in, in Syria. And, and the final point, uh, or example I would give is, if you think about the internet, uh, the rise of uh, a fragmented, balkanized internet, which is really the, the kind of capstone of this process of technological innovation and integration, I think is, is on the horizon, uh, if not already with us. So in sum, uh, this combination of demagogic populism ratified by voters who are angry and disillusioned with elite-driven and increasingly corrupt politics, uh, combined with the nostalgic call to return to uh, unfettered nationalism, will lead to much greater conflict in the world, uh, both internal and external. And the international liberal order will suffer from weaker political will to use the few instruments that we have to sustain the relative peace and development the world has enjoyed after two disastrous world wars. Sorry to be a little pessimistic, but um, I am a little, a little concerned these days. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bacone. Um, we'll now move on to a brief period where panelists can engage each other with questions if they exist and um, afterwards we will uh, move directly into the audience Q&A. Um, if there are questions being addressed to either of the two panelists on Skype, I can text them to um, them and then they will respond shortly thereafter. If there aren't questions, we can also move directly on to the audience Q&A. People can line up at one of the two mics here on the left or the right, and uh, feel free to ask a question towards one of the panelists and keep it within 60 seconds. Good morning, my name is Kai. I'm a senior at Tufts University. I'm part of the EPIC program. My question is directed uh, to Mr. Bailey, um, and it's kind of a policy question. I know we've had sort of more philosophical discussions, so forgive me. It's, it's kind of a concrete policy question. So I think. It seems to me that the panel would pretty uniformly agree, agree that these sort of middle class woes, not just in Great Britain, but um, across um, liberal states, is, is very justified. There's a large swath of um, the population in many of these states that feel significantly left behind, but in particular in Great Britain, um, this large swath of pe people has really never sort of felt quite as um, integrated into the European Union in the same way that um, um, other European states have. However, um, it's, and correct me if I'm wrong here, the European Union, a lot, a lot of what is um, quite effective about the European Union is that it um, is a, it provides um, for private sector, for the private sector to uh, engage in trade, engage in business um, easily do, through, through the sort of standardized regulatory structures it has. So any sort of given consumer good that's produced in uh, country X being exported to country Y, there is a uniform regulatory structure that makes it easy for businesses to compete um, and produce and trade their goods. In addition, um, Great Britain obviously does not use the euro, it's not in the eurozone, so it's really not um, 
vulnerable in the same way that any other European state has been, in any other European economy has been, to sort of the tensions surrounding um, the Eurozone crisis, especially um, we've heard a lot of criticism about, you know, the, um, Euro, the European Union not having sort of the fiscal capabilities, um, but having these very sort of stringent monitors. Sorry, Kai, can you get on to your question? Yeah. Sorry. So, um, given these, um, given that the Europe, given the given these conditions, how 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 does the United Kingdom leaving the European Union really on a, on a concrete policy level help Great Britain's middle and working classes who feel so disillusioned with the European Union? How, how does it actually help their economic prospects? Thank you. Thanks. I mean, it's a very fair question, but you know, the questions that were looked into. In the, at the referendum were complex um, and the ways in which they were argued were also complex um, and one of the tensions in the referendum campaign was around expertise and the economic argument that was made by the government of the day, David Cameron's uh, conservative government and every other international organization you might think of like the IMF and the World Bank about uh, the economic consequences of leaving the EU uh, and then really I suppose on the other side a, a counter argument um, that we, don't, we just don't have faith uh, in those assessments and that uh, we think that the UK uh, will have further trading opportunities that will have further benefit if we leave the EU, but also, probably more importantly, questions of identity. Mm. Um, you know. I, I think fundamentally the, the result of the referendum was a, a triumph over factors of identity and cultural affinity over a uh, kind of colder economic argument. I think I, I tried to bring that out in talking about the stories that we tell um, as, govern as governments. Um, the simple answer to your question, I think, is that there's negotiation that's being worked through to try and get the best economic deal for the UK, um, but the evidence that was on the table at the time, which was fought over uh, stridently, was not just a debate about whether it would be economically good or bad, it was a much wider debate about who we were in the world and who we wanted to be. Thank you. Can I just add yeah. something? Just a small thing about, uh, Brexit and the referendum. So a little bit of detail that maybe is relevant. We were talking just before, Mark, that there's an intergenerational aspect of this. So you probably know that the youth uh, under 24, I forget what the percentage was who voted for Remain, but very, very high, 75%. Uh, now, one of the interesting questions is who voted? Uh, what's the body politic? Um, someone from Austria here, I believe Austria has been dropping the voting age uh, for certain elections down to 16, if, I'm, if that's correct, right? I don't know if you know where 18 comes from. The voting age used to be 21 for a long time. The voting age of 21 uh, came from the Middle Ages, uh, which was the uh, age at which a man normally could carry weight of armor and therefore came of age. And my point about this is that what does that correlate with understanding about the future of our society? So one question is, why did they draw the line at age 18 in the UK? Why didn't they drop it to 16 or 14? Now, another interesting question is, how many Brits living abroad Three million, yeah. approximately, who were excluded. If you lived abroad for more than five years, fifteen. Was it? Was it fifteen? Yeah. What, what was the number who did not vote? Um, I don't know, but I, that was that. It was choice. very high. <laughs> M millions. Uh, so there's a whole question here, and, and there's been a lot of uh, polling to show that the overwhelming position of those Brits living abroad would have been Remain, particularly those living in the European Union. So then, if you look at the actual participation rate in the referendum as a whole which was not a super high uh, majority, 67%, I think it was. So if you're saying that the number of people who voted as a proportion... You didn't have a... You did, my simple point, you didn't have a real majority that actually voted to leave. So there's all these questions, you know, and what we're really talking about is a portion of the population that for various reasons was disaffected. And that's all I wanted to say, is focus on that. So rather than reducing to this, Britain decided and so forth. I, I'll just come back on that really quickly because you know it's not it's not really my my job to defend the referendum result or you know to, we we all, obviously as government officials argued the position of the day for the government when the referendum was called now we argue it for the government uh, now it's been settled but I think one of the problems we have is relitigating it um, and it was the biggest democratic exercise the UK has ever seen it had 82 percent turnout mm. um, it was a very close but very clear result at 52 to 48 percent.
Um, so I think when you, when you go back to people and say, well, it wasn't a legitimate vote, the question wasn't clear enough, not enough people voted, it should have been 100%, people had living abroad for 15 years, were, more than 15 years had been cut off. I mean, that, that says to people who voted 48%, um, 52%, um, 17 million of them, that your, your voice doesn't really count. Um, and that, you know, what was, you know if, if, you, if you take that line through, then you get back to the problems I think we've been discussing of sort of elites being seen to ignore um, the, the strongly held opinions of people. And the better thing is to try and convince them otherwise, I suppose. All right, in reflection of the, t the fact that we only have about seven minutes left in this panel, I'm going to gather four questions and then uh, directly after each other, and then we'll respond to them yeah. after acquiring all four questions. So please. So uh, given the leftward shift, kind of formerly center-left parties, especially in the United States, and kind of the, the embracing of identity politics, how do you think that formerly you know, center-left parties can actually move back um, moderate right-wing voters or moderate left-wing voters who have more social, uh, conservative social and religious values? Um, good morning, I'm Sarah from Singapore. Um, my question is not directed to any specific panelist. Um, with the rise of very reactionary and dangerous nationalist forces, I think it's undeniable that some of these sentiments are mobilized by the leaders of populist parties. However, I think that these sentiments are also very um, evident within the population of countries. So in the situation where um, populist leaders have not yet taken leadership. What can rather um, center position governments do to prevent um, the further rise of these populist sentiments and the concretization of them into taking power? Hi, my name is Julia from the Brazilian delegation, and my question is uh, directed at Mr. Bailey, but if any other of the speakers wants to answer. Um, regardless of you know what happened with Brexit, we have seen, as you said, a movement of several regions in Europe who feel like the the European Union is a, a far removed or from the regions, and the bureaucrats in Brussels kind of decide their lives for them. And I wanted to know what reforms do you think that the European Union could make to try to get closer to those people, maybe in the region, the committees region. Or if you think that's such uh, in such a, a big supranational organ that is unavoidable that some people will feel left out. Good morning, my name is Gisela and I'm also from the Brazilian delegation and my question is also to Mr. Bailey. And in your in your remarks you said something about uh, our era wanting and pursuing quick answers being um, one of the causes of populism and nationalism. And if you think about technology and the exponential growth of technology also being one of the causes of, of what we're seeing and what we're witnessing, it's kind of hard not to want quick answers because that's actually one of, it could be one of the solutions, quick, good answers. So how, what's your take on that? What, you understand because it's maybe not only a cause but also a solution. Um, do you want me to start? Or? Yeah. Um, so I think on what the EU can do, um, and again, it's obviously not for the UK government to prescribe what the EU t should do, so I, I speak personally. Um, I think there are, there are various things that have been suggested in the past about how you might forge a more European identity, and it's clear that in certain countries, like Germany, you already have a much stronger sense of European identity than you have in the UK, but I suppose uh, technology um, provides an opportunity there, um, because uh, it can be used to foster that kind of connectivity between people, um, and it needs to operate, I suppose, in tandem with vehicles for that, so in the past, People have spoken about the idea of pan-European parties. How do you create what people think of as the demos, um, the kind of political community that people feel part of? Um, and then I guess uh, kind of branding uh, and storytelling is important, that you saw places in the UK that benefit from EU regional funding um, that voted to leave the EU. Um, it's clearly important for people to know what the EU is doing. You see that with US development spending. Uh, as US aid goes into places, it's quite clear that it's from the American people. And uh, probably you need to do a better story of explaining to people 
uh, what it's doing for their specific communities and why collective actions and the wider interest. Um, I might pass to the panel and come back to the other question. Uh, well, I'll just um, respond to one or two uh, points. Uh, you know, what, what can moderates do? Um, uh, uh, the most important thing, of course, is, is to make an argument, uh, is to uh, compete for the hearts and minds of the electorate uh, in a sensible way and not go down the route of uh, romantic ideas. Um, one of the other referendums which took place, of course, in the UK was the Scottish mm. referendum, which was also looking tight at a certain point and then there was a really, really wonderful, I don't know if you remember, Gordon Brown's speech that was at the eve, or near to the yeah. eve of the election, which was finally, I would dare say, someone made a really solid argument about Remain. And uh, so uh, arguments matter. And uh, now it's not just that arguments matter. <clears throat> We've had that experience in our country too. I'm guessing Professor Rock was uh, probably involved in some degree in those days, um, uh, making the arguments uh, with regard to Quebec separatism. <clears throat> but the, the next question after, after the referendum is, what do you do about it? <clears throat> I would argue, and my point previously about 48-52, is you've got a big part of your population who lost, who didn't agree. Uh, the, last, the referendum in Quebec in, uh, uh, was in 95, uh, was uh, decided by 50,000 votes, if I remember, on a 95 or some, some cr huge, huge percentage turnout. Uh, of seven or eight million voters. I don't remember what the number was, but razor, razor thin. What was important, that meant an awful lot of people wanted out. We're ready to make a big leap. And what was really crucial was what happened afterwards, which was addressing the legitimate concerns that actually held grievances of those who wanted out. And those policies, to, not only to engage, but take them into account, uh, have gone a long way in, in changing the dynamics, so that separatism now is very low. Two things just to say, though. All of this depends, the liberal order depends, on an educated, it was Jefferson who said, for democracy to work, you need an educated and participant population. So you need education, and you need an independent partial media, and I would say access to justice. Uh, thank you all so much for coming to this panel. Unfortunately, um, we are out of time. However, I implore you all to engage with the panelists um, after this, afterwards, maybe perhaps in the dinner or lunch. Um, session. Um, um, I, I ask you all to stay in your seats as we begin. Um, as uh, Tufts University President uh, Tony Monaco um, um, introduces um, Deputy Secretary General um, Amina Mohammed. <laughs>